Okay. So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great, great pleasure and honor for me to be allowed to uh, give the opening lecture of this uh, conference. Um, I would like to dedicate uh, my talk to my predecessor, colleague, and uh, long-standing collaborator, Herbert Walter, who passed away just a few days ago. In my talk, uh, I would like to first uh, review uh, the basic, or some of the basic tools and techniques uh, that uh, have allowed uh, or have provided uh, direct uh, time domain access to electronic dynamics uh, on a sub femtosecond or attosecond time scale. Many of you uh, will probably have heard about uh, this part may, might have seen quite a few transparencies quite a few times, uh, so I apologize uh, to all those uh, for that. I hope I will be able to compensate you with the second part devoted to applications where I'm going to present uh, uh, quite a few results that we obtained very recently. Some of them have not even been written up for publication yet. Let me begin with a, a mission statement. Hopefully it works. Doesn't really seem to work at the moment. I'm sorry for that. Okay, no, it's good, guys. So, at the second physics, uh, as I understand it, aims at gaining insight into the motion of electrons on atomic uh, length scales uh, experimentally. This goal is being pursued by developing tools and techniques for direct control and real-time observation of electrons in atoms, molecules, solids, plasmas, and uh, all sorts of systems. Um, you may wonder why uh, actually this, uh, this goal is being pursued. Uh, one could, of course, now come up with quite a few possible uh, shorter or long-term implications. Uh, I prefer rather to uh, quote uh, Max Planck as a justification for uh, all these efforts. The greater the detail in which we can pursue nature on any path, the richer and more durable will be the gain that can be derived from our uh, perceptiveness. Uh, just as uh, diffraction and, image, uh, and microscopy is able to resolve uh, the structure of matter with, with ever improving resolution down to the atomic scale and probably sooner or later even down to the subatomic scale. Ultrafast spectroscopies allow one to uh, capture short-lived uh, uh, transient states of matter uh, and reconstruct dynamics uh, with an ever improving ever higher time resolution. As you all know, uh, dictated by the milli-electron volt energy spacing of vibrational levels, uh, energy levels in molecules, atoms uh, tend to move to uh, atomic motion tends to unfold in molecules uh, within the chemical bonds on a time scale of uh, tens to hundreds of femtoseconds. Uh, the energy spacing is uh, uh, getting much, much larger as uh, we move to electrons, particularly as we consider electronic motion in ever smaller dimensions, starting from nanostructures uh, down to molecular orbitals and eventually to inner shells. The energy spacing becomes larger and larger and correspondingly faster becomes the motion. That means that uh, just as atoms, uh, atomic motion requires femtosecond laser pulses to be captured, uh, electronic motion, direct access to electronic motion uh, in the time domain 
uh, will require attosecond tools. What do we mean by tools? Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, ultra-fast control and methodology relies, and this is quite general, applies to any time domain, relies on a signal with a controlled steep temporal gradient. Of course, this signal is also supposed to be able to exert a force to the particle, the motion of which we would like to steer or control with uh, uh, this signal. Uh, in modern ultrafast science, uh, uh, the steep control temporal gradient uh, uh, has been provided uh, primarily by electromagnetic uh, waves. Uh, in microwave electronics, it is uh, a controlled microwave voltage uh, that has been uh, moved, uh, that has been speeded up uh, down to the picoseconds and is able to uh, drive currents on that time scale and push the limits of electronics down to a few picoseconds. Um, Nonlinear optical techniques uh, exploited by lasers uh, have uh, paved the way to uh, femtosecond pulse generation and metrology down to the f uh, few femtosecond regime, which uh, turned out to be a pretty firm limit uh, just set by the uh, wave cycle of light uh, in the wavelength range in the near infrared where the, sh where the shortest pulses have been generated. In ultrafast optics, it is either the amplitude envelope or possibly the chirp of the pulse that introduces the well-controlled steep gradient. With the advent of controlled light waves, and I'm going to address this a little bit um, in a little bit more detail uh, just in a few minutes, uh, a new signal gradient became available for both control and measurement. A signal gradient that uh, varies on a sub femtosecond scale and it is originating directly from the very fast oscillation, very fast variation of the electric field of visible or near infrared light. We propose to refer to this new technology as uh, light wave electronics by analogy with microwave electronics, just as uh, microwave uh, uh, voltages of fields uh, drive electric current uh, in nanoscale circuits with the corresponding speed corresponding to the microwaves down to the picosecond regime. Um, in light wave electronics, the electric field of visible or near infrared light drives uh, atomic scale motion of electrons inside atoms or inside molecules on a correspondingly faster time scale. Um, let me just address uh, uh, how we, we uh, have been able to uh, produce the light waves uh, that serve uh, as a basic technology for attosecond control and hydrology. Basically, two key technologies have paved the way to them. On the one hand, uh, ultra broadband dispersion control, which are multi layers, uh, uh, open the way to uh, the routine generation of, of uh, uh, very short light pulses with a bandwidth spanning almost an octave. Uh, with a well-controlled amplitude envelope, but as you see here, with a poorly controlled or not at all controlled timing of the uh, electric field oscillations with respect to the envelope, which uh, is uh, mathematically uh, uh, quantified by the so-called carry envelope phase. It was the Nobel Prize winning uh, frequency comp technique of uh, Ted Hinch who eventually enabled us to stabilize this timing of the oscillations with respect to the envelope and in this way stabilize uh, the waveform and uh, allowed us to produce intense few cycle light waves with precisely reproducible uh, evolution of the electric and of course also magnetic field. 
uh, in a, an attempt to uh, use these uh, waves for triggering, inducing, and, and, and uh, subsequently also controlling uh, electronic motion uh, inside atoms, we exposed uh, atoms to these pulses and adjusted the intensity of the pulses such that uh, uh, the uh, atoms uh, uh, have been ionized uh, by, by the field. What then happens has been predicted long time ago by Paul Corcom in his famous paper in 93. He came up with a, uh, and also Ken Schaefer, by the way, more or less the same time, um, uh, uh, came up with, uh, with a uh, so-called three-step uh, uh, model uh, of uh, strong field ionization, of strong field ionization by a linearly polarized uh, laser field in the first step. Uh, the laser field, once it became strong enough, suppresses the column barrier and uh, barrier and, and uh, allows the electron to escape with some probability, the most weakly bound electron to escape with some probability. Then uh, the next step is the, the motion in the, in the uh, laser field. And since the uh, direction of the field is reversed in the next cycle, the electron may come back uh, to the vicinity of the core and uh, um, actually recollide with uh, its parent ion. Uh, one of the consequences of this recollision is uh, a possible recombination of the electron back into its ground state upon which uh, uh, the en its, its kinetic energy must be released and it is, it is being released in the form of an energetic photon. Because uh, the electrons uh, may have very different energies at the instant of the recollision, uh, the photon energies uh, are also covering a broad range, uh, uh, ranging all the way from UV up to soft X-ray uh, photon energies. Uh, in a few cycle wave, uh, what is special is that uh, we have just a few uh, uh, ionization and subsequent recollision events. Therefore, the peaks that you see here are not really genuine harmonics as you are used to when you, when you create this, when you induce this process by a long multi-cycle pulse where, where, where this uh, uh, ionization and recollision is, is perfectly periodic and consequently the uh, emission spectrum of a periodic uh, process uh, uh, consists of, uh, of evenly spaced uh, uh, lines which uh, constitute high order harmonics of the driving laser field. Here uh, what, what we observe experimentally is that uh, these, the position of these peaks shift just by shifting the carrier envelope phase of these pulses without uh, touching any other pulse parameters. That means that of course uh, these peaks have nothing to do with harmonics because if they were harmonics they must they should be locked to an integer multiple of the driver wave but nevertheless of course the physics behind the generation process is, is exactly the same as in as in long pulses I, I, I just have difficulties to refer to this uh, to, uh, to this this radiation high order harmonics uh, uh, under the conditions when we create them with a, with a very short pulse because actually there is nothing like harmonics uh, in a spectrum when we, when we measure it. Okay, so uh, this is one, one point. Uh, the more important point is that in a few cycle wave actually uh, there is one recollision event which is uh, at the zero, near the zero transition following the pulse peak uh, the, the electrons uh, uh, which ca come back to the, to the vicinity of the parent ion around this instant uh, uh, possess a significantly higher kinetic energy than all other electrons and therefore uh, if uh, we filter out the highest energy photons uh, from the emitted radiation we expect to, uh, them to originate from this single recollision event. This is at this point just an expectation, uh, but this is what, uh, what actually uh, the strong field uh, theory of Paul Corkum, Ken Schaefer and others, and of course all the, all the uh, uh, numerical calculations also support. 
so this may be the recipe uh, for the generation of a single isolated uh, sub femtosecond XUV pulse. But of course, uh, this is not quite as simple because uh, you immediately see if you, if you switch uh, uh, to a sine wave, just shift uh, the, uh, the wave with respect to the envelope by pi over 2, the carry envelope phase by pi over 2. You see that with, this, with, with the same, otherwise the same laser pulse, for very obvious symmetry reasons, even uh, in this highest, uh, uh, these highest photon energies, you will uh, have contributions from at least two recollisions because there is at least two trajectories that uh, deliver the electrons back to the vicinity of the parent ion with the same kinetic energy. So from this must be obvious, it must be obvious that, uh, that uh, the control over the waveform is, is, is really, really a key issue to be able to control uh, electronic processes and all, all concomitant uh, uh, phenomena like XUV emission within the wave cycle that is on a sub femtosecond or attosecond time scale. Actually, uh, uh, XUV emission is not the only consequence of, uh, of, uh, of recollision. There is uh, several other consequences. Uh, one of them is a backscattering of the uh, returning electron. You can imagine it just like, like uh, uh, the, the electron can be bounced back from the, the electron that returns uh, to the vicinity of the core can be bounced back from the parent ion just like a billiard ball uh, and uh, can pick up uh, pretty high kinetic energy this way. Uh, again, uh, if we do this in a controlled way with a few cycle, with a waveform controlled few cycle pulse, we, for the same reasons as I told you before, we expect uh, in the case of a cosine waveform one single electron trajectory which returns with the maximum energy and therefore is bounced back as a backscattered electron with the maximum energy and that's exactly what you see here. By the way, these measurements have been performed by Gerhard Paulus and, and, and uh, uh, co-workers together with some of my colleagues uh, by placing two detectors uh, uh, aligned opposite to each other with the laser field and detecting the electrons that have been ejected uh, parallel to the laser field in the two opposite directions. So you see uh, in the upper direction this, uh, this black line clearly indicates that uh, for a cosine pulse uh, the spectrum, the energy spectrum of the electrons uh, uh, extends by quite a few EV more to higher energies than, than, than that of the electrons uh, backscattered downwards. Now if we shift the carry envelope phase by pi over 2, turn the, laser, the, 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 the waveform from cosine to sine, uh, you see that the cutoff is exactly the same, becomes exactly the same. Uh, if we go a step further, uh, add another pi over half to uh, phase shift uh, uh, in this way, basically just flip the electric field uh, over so that uh, at the center of the pulse the electric field doesn't point upwards but it points downwards and we get exactly the opposite situation where the energy spectrum of the uh, uh, electrons backscatter downwards extend to higher energies than the other one, and so on and so forth. So this, uh, this uh, series of measurements uh, uh, demonstrates impressively that uh, indeed with the waveform of uh, this few cycle light wave, it is indeed possible to control the motion of, of electrons inside or around an atom on an angstrom length scale and the sub femtosecond time scale. Actually, it also teaches us that uh, this uh, specific measurement technique may be extremely useful, provides a very simple and intuitive way of actually measuring the waveform, of determining the waveform. There is really nothing, uh, involved, no involved uh, complicated uh, uh, theory behind this. This is just simply, very, very simply classical physics. You, you, you just describe the electron like a billiard ball and, and, and uh, just uh, Newton's equation uh, tells us that for such a cosine pulse, the uh, electron coming back upwards must possess a larger energy than the, the other one coming downwards, and so on and so forth. So basically, just based on this very simple intuitive model, we are allowed to determine the waveform. Now let me 
just come back to to the XUV emission uh, because this is, I mean, in this case, of course, we also produce, uh, at least we believe we produce uh, sub-femtosecond electron pulses. So basically these backscattered electrons, if you would, would filter them properly, uh, energetically, maybe just this uh, uh, last five, uh, last few electron volts, for sure uh, would be confined, uh, the emission would be confined to a fraction of a femtosecond. But of course, electron pulse is very rapidly dispersed because of, of the finite uh, energy uh, spread and are not easy to use uh, sort of outside this atom. There have been a few beautiful experiments where these rare collision electrons have been used uh, for spectroscopy uh, uh, during the rare collision, but, but uh, it's hard to use them afterwards just as a sort of independent source of of electron pulses. Uh, for, for this uh, purpose, uh, the XUV pulses emitted uh, from this rare collision process um, uh, lent themselves uh, much, uh, uh, in a much better way. And therefore, we are, of course, interested in, 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 in using them. But before we can use them, we have to characterize them. I just uh, recapitulate very briefly uh, how we have done that, just for the sake of those few of you who might not be familiar with uh, what has been referred to as the attosecond streak camera. So I just start with the basic concept of the streak camera, which most of you know. Uh, photoelectrons knocked off by the short pulse that we want to characterize are deflected uh, by a transverse voltage ramp. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this, uh, this deflection, uh, this voltage ramp varies linearly in time, maps basically the temporal distribution of this uh, uh, incident light pulse, which is the same as the temporal distribution of the photoelectron uh, pulse, uh, to a spatial distribution of the photoelectrons on a screen. This is what has been called a streak, streak image, and this streak image uh, uh, within the resolution limits of this device, uh, uh, basically displays uh, the uh, or mirrors uh, the uh, temporal intensity profile of the incident pulse, short pulse to be measured. State of the art uh, electron optical street cameras achieve a resolution of around 100 femtoseconds. Now, the question was can this uh, resolution be improved by a factor of 1,000 or something like that to use the same concept uh, for uh, uh, performing uh, similar measurements on the XUV pulses, which are supposed to have a duration of uh, just a few hundred uh, attoseconds? Well, imagine that uh, the photocathode is replaced uh, by an ensemble of atoms and uh, the field, the uh, microwave field that deflects the photoelectrons replaced by a light field, a very rapidly varying light field. This means that electrons that are uh, ejected at slightly different instants will uh, pick up different, uh, um, uh, uh, will gain a different amount of momentum and energy from this light field depending on the instant of release. So basically the light field streaks their final energy distribution, which can be very easily measured uh, by a time of flight detector. And this is now what we call a streak image, but in this case not in, 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 in real space, but uh, uh, in this case basically in energy or momentum space, uh, whatever you, you, uh, 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 you choose here as a variable uh, 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 basically for the electron count. So basically uh, what you end up with is a uh, final photoelectron energy spectrum that is uh, streaked uh, 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 in a way that uh, in this process uh, basically the uh, temporal history of emission is encoded. Now you may wonder how it is encoded, how it is encoded. Uh, uh, in specific cases, we may choose uh, actually a, a specific delay uh, between uh, or timing between the uh, sub femtosecond pulse to be measured and uh, the uh, streaking laser field in a way that from one single measurement under specific uh, circumstances we may get the information we are interested in. But uh, I would like to emphasize that in this technique, this is not necessary, this restriction, because it is very easy. We can implement the 
a, a variable delay between uh, the streaking laser field and the uh, XUV pulse to be measured very, very easily. So not only does this streaking field provide a sub femtosecond signal gradient for measurements in the attosecond domain, also can we uh, uh, adjust uh, uh, the timing of this gradient with respect to the signal to be measured with attosecond accuracy. This means we can record a whole series of uh, such streaked spectra at slightly different timing of the signal to be measured with respect to the streaking function or streaking signal. And I guess you, you can imagine that from such a series of spectra we can learn much more than just from one single streak image. Here you see uh, one such set of data which has been uh, compiled from a series of streaked photoelectron spectra, so basically each a vertical slice uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, false color represented uh, data set uh, constitutes uh, a streaked uh, photoelectron image uh, which has been measured at a specific delay between the XUV pulse knocking off the photoelectrons and the streaking uh, laser field. Uh, many of you will recognize in this something that you know very well from a technique that has been uh, invented quite a few years ago and uh, dubbed frequency resolved optical gating. This set of data is nothing else but a spectrogram. This is the same spectrogram what you measure in frequency resolved optical gating with the only essential difference that the gating signal here is not the amplitude envelope of a femtosecond pulse like it is in the conventional implementation of FROG, but it is the oscillating field itself. And therefore, your resolution is now not limited by the steepness of the amplitude envelope of the laser pulse, which is several femtoseconds, but allows you to achieve a resolution down to the attosecond regime thanks to the sub-femtosecond gradient in your gating signal. So you know from the, from the, from the work of Rick Trebino and many others uh, that uh, such a spectrogram, if recorded with a sufficiently good signal-to-noise ratio, provides sufficient information to retrieve, to unambiguously retrieve both the gating function as well as the gated or sampled quantity, which is in our case the XUV pulse itself. Uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, this retrieval is particularly simple. Actually, without any cumbersome data analysis, you, you will figure out what you are seeing here. Since uh, the spectrogram resembles the oscillations of the few cycle wave, it is obvious that the uh, sampled event must be confined in time to a small fraction of the half oscillation period. Would this not be the case, these oscillations would be blurred. This is conclusion number one, without any cumbersome data analysis. So uh, we can conclude that a sub single sub femtosecond pulse must have been at work here. Conclusion number two, this uh, sub femtosecond pulse uh, is synchronized to the few cycle wave used as a gating signal here with sub femtosecond precision. The timing jitter must be smaller than, must be much smaller than one femtosecond. Would this not be the case again? The uh, oscillations could not be resolved because uh, these data have been acquired during a large, large number of laser shots. So would uh, the XUV pulse jitter 
with respect to the few cycle wave from one laser shot to the next would it jitter by something like the half oscillation cycle of course the accumulated uh, signal would not show any resemblance to the oscillations anymore so these are two very important conclusions now let's just move, move ahead and again uh, refer to a simply classical analysis which can be done once the electron has been freed by the XUV pulse and starts moving in the streaking laser field if we describe this motion classically uh, we conclude that the energy that the, an electron that is ejected parallel to the uh, uh, to the polarization direction of the laser field gains this amount of energy uh, at, uh, at the release time t namely an energy that is equal to the product of the initial momentum of the electron which it picks up uh, well the corresponding energy it picks up from the XUV photon uh, so this can be controlled by the XUV photon energy and uh, the vector potential of the streaking field at the instant of uh, uh, release so once we, we know this vector potential and this is basically just this white line here from that we can immediately determine the electric field of this pulse by just uh, deriving uh, differentiating uh, uh, this vector potential with respect to time so in this way we obtain a uh, uh, laser pulse with a pulse duration of 4.3 femtoseconds this is full width at half maximum carried at a wavelength of 750 nanometers which corresponds to a uh, oscillation cycle of 2.5 femtoseconds with the gating uh, signal known it is nothing uh, simpler but determining uh, determining the gated function actually in this specific case since it turns out we have a very well behaved pulse which is very close to, to uh, its Fourier limit uh, it can be shown that it is enough to, to select just two streaked images uh, taken at two uh, adjacent uh, zero transitions of the vector potential which means two adjacent maxima of the laser field and from that together with the field free spectrum we can retrieve uh, the pulse, uh, both its uh, uh, amplitude envelope and a little bit of, of temporal uh, chirp uh, is also obvious, which by the way does not relate to a spectral uh, phase, but it relates to some asymmetry in the spectrum. So we end up with the conclusion that uh, we have here something like 250 attosecond uh, uh, XUV pulses, a single 250 attosecond XUV pulse that carried at a photon energy of around 95 EV. All right, uh, how does the experimental system look like? Uh, uh, we produce these pulses in neon gas. Uh, uh, the, pr uh, the, the radiation is produced in a nice collimated beam just because the process is, is highly coherent, just as every harmonic generation process, if you do it properly. Uh, and we uh, reflect these two beams with a two component mirror. Uh, this mirror uh, serves several purposes. On the one hand, uh, we can introduce a delay with this uh, mirror, a delay of the XUV pulse with respect to the laser pulse uh, with at a second accuracy. Uh, secondly, uh, the central mirror which reflects the XUV beam uh, uh, also fulfills a filtering function. It reflects only light between the uh, photon, between photon energies of 90 to 100 EV. So it makes sure that uh, as you can remember, just discussed before, that uh, we, we select only photons that originate from one single recollision event uh, in the strongly driven uh, atom. Uh, last but not least, uh, these mirrors focus both pulses into a second uh, a gas jet where uh, the XUV pulse knocks off in the street camera measurement, knocks off valence band photoelectrons and these are accelerated or decelerated by this laser field just as I, as I explained to you before and, uh, and the streaked el uh, electron spectra are just measured in this time of flight electron spectrometer now the important uh, comment that I would like to make here is that this apparatus uh, is not only suited for the metrology of the tools itself namely 
for characterizing the XUV pulse and the few cycle laser wave, just as I explained you before, but exactly the same apparatus can afterwards be used for attosecond spectroscopy. So the experiments that I'm going to show you now in the remaining few minutes uh, have been done with exactly the same apparatus, with uh, the only difference that in some cases uh, the time of flight detector has been replaced by another detector, like a, a velocity map imaging uh, detector or a reflectron uh, uh, observing um, uh, ions of different charge states. But otherwise, the rest of the system was left the same. So this is how it looks like in reality. So basically, this is the laser in the back, and, and this is what we call the sort of latest generation at the second beam line here, another perspective. So this is the chamber where we generate uh, the, the XUV light and both beams, both the laser and the XUV beam then propagate down uh, this tube here to uh, arrive uh, in the second uh, uh, chamber where the actual experiments uh, take place. The main improvement here has been uh, as compared to our previous beam lines, the, the vast improvement in, in vacuum conditions. So previously we thought that maybe uh, we don't have to worry about vacuum too much uh, because we introduce a lot of gas anyway for generating the, the harmonics then for, for doing the, the street camera measurements. But it turns out that actually this gas is of course not a problem. So you can introduce the gas that you want to use in amounts uh, whatever you want. The main thing is that, uh, that you, you can eliminate other kinds of materials and for that purpose uh, you should try to, to reduce uh, uh, the background pressure to levels possible. Uh, okay, so let's now turn our attention to attosecond spectroscopy. So far uh, we have selected uh, a valence uh, photoelectron emitted from, from some valence uh, electronic state that responds essentially instantly to the incident XUV radiation even on a sub femtosecond time scale. This is what we have utilized in our streak camera measurement because what we measure uh, in our streaking measurement is of course not directly the temporal evolution of the XUV pulse but the temporal evolution of this uh, photo-emitted uh, uh, electron wave packet. And uh, only if this uh, photo-emission process responds nearly instantly to the incident XUV field can we assume that what we measure here is actually nothing else but the duration of the XUV pulse. So it can be shown that this is really a good approximation in all those cases where this measurement has been done in the past. Now, of course, the same thing, and this, this, well, this is what we have been referred to as the attosecond streak camera. Now, the same streaking concept can, of course, also be applied to uh, processes like OG emission, where uh, what happens is uh, uh, a, 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 a basically an inter inter inner shell uh, vacancy is filled by an electron. Uh, knocking off a second electron and the emission of this uh, secondary electron or OG electron, uh, uh, the emission time of this OG electron is uh, equal to the relaxation time, to the filling time of this inner shell vacancy. So now we can just uh, go ahead and basically apply the same streaking technique uh, to these electrons, to these OG electrons, and we are supposed to be able to learn uh, the duration of uh, emission of this OG electron and from that the lifetime of the inner shell vacancy. Here you see a, a series of, of, of spectrograms uh, uh, calculated by Armin Skrinci and co-workers in Vienna uh, back in uh, 2002 uh, for different uh, uh, core hole uh, uh, vacancy lifetimes. Uh, ranging from a couple of hundred attoseconds up to several femtoseconds. You see for very short uh, uh, lifetimes the spectrogram uh, resembles the one that we have taken with the photoelectrons. So basically the uh, photoelectron spectrum is shifted up and down as the laser field or its vector potential more precisely oscillates. 
uh, this is still visible uh, up to something like one femtosecond, but actually the, the uh, modulation or, or any, any variation of the streaked spectra on, on, uh, within the uh, wave cycle tends to gradually disappear as the whole lifetime becomes longer and longer and becomes eventually significantly longer uh, than the uh, wave cycle of the uh, streaking field. So in this limit, uh, uh, what takes over the sampling function from the electric field is basically the uh, envelope of the laser pulse. Because what you see here is uh, the emergence of sidebands spaced by the laser photon energy from the main line, main Auger line, which is this one. And uh, the, uh, the appearance and disappearance of, the, uh, disappearance of this sideband as a function of delay um, is the result of a convolution between the OG emission process and the amplitude envelope of the laser pulse. So from, from just by just measuring uh, the amplitude of the sideband as a function of delay uh, and uh, subsequent deconvolution, we can obtain the emission. And uh, uh, it is this regime where the first uh, uh, inner shell spectroscopic experiment has taken place, which uh, yielded uh, uh, a lifetime of, of an MCL 3D vacancy in Krypton of about 8 femtoseconds. Um, of course, uh, uh, streaking is not only suitable for determining inner shell lifetimes. You could ask, you could consider asking also other quite exciting questions. For instance, look at this situation here where photo emission is, actually core hole photo emission, is uh, accompanied by shake-up. What does this mean? Uh, the energy of the incident XUV photon is not completely transmitted to one single electron that is ejected, like in the case here, but a fraction of it is, is uh, uh, transmitted uh, uh, to another electron, which undergoes, which is promoted from another bound state. This is what, uh, what people call shake-up. And in this context, we may ask the question how this shake-up actually occurs. Is, it, uh, is the energy of the incoming photon instantly shared between the photoelectron and this excited electron and the, uh, the photo emission not affected by the shake-up? Or does uh, the core electron first pick up the entire photon energy and transfers, uh, trans transmits a fraction of it to another electron as it as it is coming out of the atom. These are two uh, very different possibilities and we may expect that, uh, that in the second case uh, if, if, if this uh, uh, electron transfers a fraction of its energy to, to another one, uh, maybe the emission time does not exactly uh, look the same as in the case where, where all the photon energy is taken up by one single electron. So by, by comparing these two streaked spectra, maybe we can learn something about shake-up. Is there any other possibility of, of, of uh, learning something uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, inner atomic uh, excitation and relaxation processes uh, directly in the time domain uh, with these tools? There is also another possibility. Instead of, uh, uh, instead of probing uh, the electrons that... Uh, have been ejected from the atom. We can also use uh, the laser field to, uh, to promote uh, originally bound electrons uh, to positive energies and set them free by tunneling ionization. Now imagine if we do this with the uh, shaken up electrons, then uh, in this way, in principle, we may be able to measure uh, either the shake up uh, process itself or if it uh, uh, accompanies instantly some other process, be it photo emission, be it Auger emission, then this other process. What is the, time, the expected time resolution here? Well, if uh, we are really able to, to induce this transition by means of tunneling, then Keldish theory predicts that tunneling is uh, confined to uh, a tiny... Uh, uh, very narrow time interval near the oscillation cycle where the field is maximum. 
the emission time uh, is predicted to be just a tiny fraction of the half oscillation period. So we expect uh, the ionization going on step-like. And if we can see the steps, then these steps can be used as a probing function for probing any sorts of inner shell or intra-atomic uh, uh, relaxation or, uh, or excitation processes. First of all, we have to check whether this tunneling really takes place, whether we, we, before we, we can consider uh, uh, the possibility of using it for at the second time of spectroscopy. To this end, we have first selected a system where actually this uh, core uh, 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 level photo emission could not take place to avoid the possibility uh, of, of, of OJ relaxation, which might complicate uh, the whole dynamics. So we would like now to see a situation where basically the XUV pulse comes in, uh, uh, ionizes uh, the atom, and during this ionization with some probability shakes up bound electrons into this state. And this is what we would like to extract with our laser pulse that is coming in in a time-delayed fashion. The intensity of the laser pulse is adjusted such that it cannot ionize uh, neutral atoms with a larger uh, ionization potential. In the case of neon, the ionization potential is 21.5 electron volts. Uh, and the, uh, uh, by shake-up, we can populate states with binding energy uh, in the range of 10 eV. So we can adjust uh, the laser field strength in such a way that we can uh, reach uh, these states, but we can't ionize neutral neon. That's exactly what we have done. And here you see the result. The result shows us that indeed, just as, as we expected, uh, and Kerdish predicted some 40 years ago, we, we see the very nice and clear steps uh, near uh, uh, the individual oscillation peaks of the probing uh, laser field. Uh, we can also go on and, and uh, do measurements where we change the carry envelope phase of the laser pulse. Uh, this is here, and if you take a close look, we'll not have time for taking a very close look, but uh, you just have to believe me that in the case of the red curve, we have something like four steps. In the case of the blue curve, we have rather three steps, again, exactly as we expect from the symmetry considerations of, uh, uh, of the two pulses of, of a cosine and sine wave, and here we just zoom in uh, into the uh, central few femtoseconds, and you can very clearly see uh, each uh, half cycle there is quite a significant step upwards in the ionization probability. From this, we can set a very safe upper limit for tunneling and shake up of around 400 attoseconds. Probably this is a very uh, conservative estimate, and probably the, the real uh, response times uh, are significantly shorter. Now, with, 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 with this working, we can take the next step and now uh, apply this, this uh, tunneling process for probing an OG relaxation. Now, we, we choose a system in which we, we produce a core hole by our XUV pulse. This system is, in this case, xenon. And uh, this, so basically, the incident XUV pulse just ionizes xenon, produces a single charge xenon atom. Now an OJ process follows, which produces a double charged xenon atom, and during this OJ process uh, uh, also shake up occurs. Now we probe this, this shaked up electron uh, by uh, the uh, tunneling uh, transition that uh, we can induce with the time delayed probe laser pulse. And uh, here you see uh, uh, the result, uh, xenon 3 plus is the final product, because this guy here makes this electron tunnel, so makes from xenon 2 plus to xenon 3 plus. But this process can take place only after, after uh, this electron has appeared here, has been shaken up. It is being shaken up by the OJ process. So the OJ decay must precede the probing. So from that it follows that basically the, the rise time of the signal contains the OG relaxation time. And this is exactly the case. Uh, from this rise time we can extract a 6 femtosecond uh, uh, OG relaxation time, single OG decay, which, uh, uh, which uh, fits perfect uh, frequency domain data. 
Actually, we can go even a step further from frequency domain measurements. We also know that in this system, a single OJ uh, decay is uh, also accompanied by double OJ decay. So basically, the, the atom can relax back into its uh, lowest energy state also by a cascaded OJ process, which actually produces uh, as an end state uh, xenon 3 plus rather than 2 plus. Of course, we don't see it here because here with the laser we also produce xenon 3 plus, so the function is the same. Therefore, we have switched to xenon 4 plus, which is also with a small probability produced by the laser, either by sequential or non sequential double ionization. And here we see uh, beautifully the decay of the signal which is nothing else but the lifetime of the double OJ process, which uh, amounts to 29 femtoseconds. And this is the very first measurement of this double OJ lifetime. Um, actually, it's, it's um, quite uh, paradoxical that uh, attosecond spectroscopy has, uh, for the first time, uh, measured something that frequency domain spectroscopy could not reveal at long times. Why is that? because uh, the longer the lifetime becomes, the narrower the corresponding spectrum. And the frequency domain people at some point, of course, get limited by the resolution of their uh, photoelectron spectrometry. So basically, in this case, uh, the French group that uh, characterized this uh, in the frequency domain just a couple of years ago could set only an upper limit of, uh, uh, of uh, sorry, a lower limit of 23 femtosecond for, for this based on the resolution or limited by the resolution of their, their, um, their spectrometer. Uh, this is basically nothing new. They have, have been able to, to, to determine this from domain data very, very accurately. Okay, now uh, I guess my time is almost over, but let me just address this, this very last point uh, very quickly. Um, so far, all uh, measurements have been have all attosecond spectroscopic measurements have been uh, uh, realized in the gas phase on isolated systems. This prompts the question whether this technology might be extendable to solids. The motivation is very clear. There is a wealth of, uh, of, of electron phenomena in solids which take place on a time scale of a few femtoseconds or shorter. Uh, just think of uh, things like uh, charge screening in metals, uh, electron-electron scattering of hot electrons, uh, short-lived uh, transient uh, excitons uh, which have been predicted in metals uh, during the time before charge screening sets in, uh, charge transfer uh, on the surface from a molecule to the bulk, basically host gas uh, processes and so on and so forth. So there is really, really a tremendous variety of, of, of questions out there which, uh, which uh, wait to be answered uh, once there is a suitable spectroscopic tool for that. The question is, uh, might any of these spectroscopies be suitable for that? Uh, uh, tunneling spectroscopy we can probably exclude uh, very easily because in a solid we have states, not just virtual, but real states very up to very close to the vacuum level. So it is very likely that, the, uh, that upon applying a strong field, the electron chooses to undergo this transition by tunneling. Rather, it will just uh, go up uh, by single photon transitions. It will find levels there uh, which it can use, just uh, sort of uh, reside intermediately and then take the next step. And of course, this process is very slow. Basically, this would extend over the entire laser pulse, so this would not give us at a second resolution. That's at least what I think. Maybe you correct me. Uh, so uh, let's just focus ourselves uh, to attosecond streaking. Um, there is no reason why this should not work, at least in principle. Unfortunately, in practice, there is uh, reasons why, why it might be difficult, at least. The working function in a, in a, in a solid is uh, very small as compared to the ionization potential of atoms. That means that at a fairly low electric field strength, uh, this guy here will start extracting electrons by multiphoton uh, or thermal photoemission, which is not what we want in streaking spectroscopy. We want to use this probing pulse, of course, just for free, free transitions after the electron has been set free by the XUV pulse. So uh, it turns out that uh, 
uh, there is at least for our currently available 95 electron volt uh, XUV photon energy of just a very, very narrow range, uh, a parameter range for the laser intensity where streaking may be strong enough, but you do not extract, you do not ionize uh, the system by the laser so strongly that basically everything is buried in, in, in ATI electrons. So yeah, I'm, I'm just about to wrap up. Uh, so just let me, let me close with, with showing you uh, this result, which was uh, acquired by uh, Adrian Cavalieri just a few weeks ago, a postdoc who joined us from uh, the Buxbaum group from, from Stanford and has been working on this for almost a year, and, and the project has came several times to a point where we were discussing whether we should stop it or go ahead. Fortunately, we didn't stop. So at last, uh, uh, he managed to produce a beautiful streaking of both uh, conduction band electrons coming directly from the Fermi edge in this uh, uh, system which was tungsten in this case as well as uh, uh, core hole electrons which come from the 4F uh, uh, state of tungsten. We did not have time yet for, for uh, retrieving uh, the temporal behavior of these electrons, but it is quite obvious that uh, it must be sub-femtosecond because otherwise you would not see, see the, 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 the waves here. And uh, the, the interesting question is certainly uh, whether the two electrons behave the same, whether uh, the laser, for instance, uh, does some heating on the conduction band electrons and, and uh, maybe induces a delayed response whereas the core electrons cannot be reached by the laser and therefore uh, they are emitted uh, just as, as uh, they are supposed to be by determined basically by the XUV parts. Okay, so let me just go ahead and to my, to my last transparency. And acknowledge, oh, sorry. Something is. Okay. So finally, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, uh, many, many uh, dedicated and uh, uh, highly motivated young uh, co-workers who are listed here. I don't have the time to, to quote them all by names. Uh, and of course also a number of, of uh, collaborators uh, without whose contributions uh, uh, these results could not have been achieved. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, this is, this is a very good point. That's what I mentioned before, that uh, we really have to make sure that we select uh, 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 valence, uh, specific valence band photoelectrons that have a fast enough response. Now the question is apparently how to figure out whether the, the response is fast enough. Fortunately enough, uh, to this end, you don't have to do any time domain experiment. Uh, all you have to do is to look at the... At the uh, uh, transition probabilities as a function of photon energy. And these data are uh, available from, uh, from synchrotron measurements. If this uh, transition probability is flat over the photon energy range that you are interested in, then you basically know that the, that the response is instantaneous. If it, uh, if, if it, if it, uh, if it shows some wide structure, then you should be very, very careful. You mean afterwards, after the electron is emitted? Oh, well, that's, thank you, that's another very good point. So actually, uh, it, it is very, very essential that the interaction takes place right after the electron comes out. 
So there is no time left for the electron to propagate. The interaction time is, you know, the few femtoseconds determined by the laser pulse, and you can calculate how far the electron propagates during these few femtoseconds. An electron with a kinetic energy of roughly 100 eV, but it could actually be even higher, this will not, not uh, propagate, uh, not travel a substantial distance. So basically, this is really very important, and thank you very much for, for this question. This is another essential difference, uh, very important difference between the traditional street camera and the the, the atomic version of the street camera. Because in the traditional street camera, even if you could speed up the deflection voltage somehow, you might think that basically it is the microwave deflection voltage that doesn't allow you to achieve high resolution. This is wrong. Uh, this would not help if you would speed it up. The problem is that, that the electrons that come out of the photocathode come out, of course, with an ele energy, finite energy distribution, and they immediately start to spread spread also in time. And by the time uh, they start interacting with the microwave field and they eventually arrive on the screen, of course, they suffer a lot from this initial uh, energy spread. Now, in the atomic implementation, this energy spread is encoded in the process. This is not a limitation. Uh, and this is not a limitation because you apply the field immediately. I have a question about uh, one of your last points, which I think you said that it's very difficult to do um, a, uh, an optical, treat, a, a optical uh, field emission experiment from a solid because of the presence of lots of levels, and so you're dominated by multi photons. So, a couple of comments on that. First, first of all, it's really the you know, DC field emission is a field line microscope, so this, this happens. Um, and so in, at least in certain solids. I mean, probably not in all of them, but yeah, yeah I agree. So I agree. Some, so some that That's right. The 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 is that I, I think that that have been studying this problem. I think that they just recently had a publication where they claimed that they could see both. They could see that they could differentiate the multi photons in the field of the process. I could be wrong about that because it's not. Do you mean the paper where they illuminated the tip with a short pulse? I'm not sure about that, but maybe maybe I didn't uh, read it carefully enough. Mm -hmm. But 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 this is I mean uh, maybe I was mis uh, I was I was uh, not properly understood. So uh, this is a very good point. I was not trying to say that uh, the attosecond tunneling spectroscopy may not be extendable to any uh, specific system. This might possibly work with some selected systems, but may not be that easily generalizable as the attosecond uh, streaking spectroscopy for a b uh, wide range of systems. Because in, in many cases, uh, thermionic uh, or thermal or, or, or basically single photon cascaded uh, 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 transitions might uh, be the dominant channel. And then, of course, you will not have uh, an attosecond resolution. That's right. So the question I would put is a general question. Is where will we win? Um, well, um, we will win as soon as uh, as soon as uh, we are so far that uh, we can leave the domain of uh, proof of principle measurements. We feel safe enough that uh, our measurement system is doing exactly what we want it to do. We are not at that stage yet. We are just trying to learn and trying to gain confidence. Once we have uh, come to this point, there is a wealth of, of, of uh, uh, dynamics where the final state of the process can be reached through different channels. In this very moment, uh, you will have to do with interfering quantum transitions. And this also immediately implies very complicated structures in the spectral domain. And from these complicated structures in the spectral domain, it is usually very, very difficult to 
retrieve unambiguously the temporal evolution. It looks like they, they, they are uh, well, it looks like they are modulated in phase, but okay, but uh, um, I'm not sure I would interpret this uh, as something like phase locked electrons. I mean they, they, uh, their energy spectrum is streaked uh, after they come out and basically what you see here the more or less uh, well in phase oscillations is uh, just uh, a, a consequence of the fact that the electric field acts on both electrons in the same way so I'm not sure uh, from this we can say anything about the relative coherence of the two electrons but maybe I'm wrong so at least I mean uh, at least what, what we can of course learn is that they appear in the continuum in a very similar way so the they time structure in both cases uh, seem to be sub femtosecond, but uh, uh, whether they, there is any, any differences once we take a closer look, uh, well, we'll have to wait until uh, we have done the analysis of the spectrogram, which has not happened yet. Okay. Uh, you always talk about the, the use of the auto to pump the system, and then you use the uh, uh, whether we can turn turn the rolls around, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, actually, this gives me the opportunity to show you one of the transparencies that I actually wanted to show you. Um, one, uh, if you ask me where could be the next frontier, uh, I would tend to say to extend at the second technologies to, to biological processes. One of, one of, uh, one of uh, such processes of really, really central importance is charge transfer in biomolecules. Um, if uh, we would understand how this, this happens, we would probably understand how biological signal transmission occurs or how the detailed elementary mechanisms behind uh, the damage or repair of a DNA molecule, molecule looks like. So this is really of central importance and uh, uh, Francois Remarkle and uh, Rafi Levine have uh, shown just a few months ago in this publication that uh, under certain conditions a charge transfer, basically transferring uh, an electron or a hole from one end of a biomolecule to the other can take place within sub femtoseconds and not only that, what is even more exciting that it looks like our currently available etosecond tools may also allow us to probe this because what they have also calculated, this is unpublished so you will not find this in the paper uh, that uh, uh, by now sending in a time delayed XUV pulse let's just take our 250 etosecond 95 EV XUV pulse, this is what they have used in their calculations. What you see is how the photoelectron spectrum looks like uh, as uh, this electron moves from one end of the molecule to the other. So you see there is a very, very clear uh, variation, a very significant variation which might allow us to, to probe uh, this process and to, uh, to, to observe this process uh, in real time. So this is exactly the type of spectroscopy you have mentioned. Here we would use the few cycle pulse or some derivatives of it, some frequency converted, maybe a UV, very short UV pulse to, to create this charge here by some localized UV transition in the molecule and then probe the process by time delayed uh, XUV pulse. Perturbed by what?
This was a very good comment. I think uh, our theory colleagues are now challenged. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's correct. Uh, in this case, uh, you, you really have to, have to make this check and, and also make sure that, that either you understand uh, how this influence looks like or uh, create experimental conditions where this influence uh, can be neglected. Now, what helps us is the following. We, also, we were also quite worried about this. Uh, we're wor worried about the fact that maybe uh, in shake-up we populate uh, very highly excited bound states, very close to the vacuum level, which you can extract by uh, absorbing maybe one photon uh, or two photons. In this case, of course, there is no chance for, for, for realizing a transition for making tunneling the dominant channel, which will spoil your time resolution completely. And uh, these are also the electrons that are most susceptible, of course, to the influence of the external field. The higher the, I mean, the closer they are, I mean, the more weakly they are, they are bound, the more susceptible they are to external fields. So uh, uh, the, what saves us is apparently the fact that in most systems, the population uh, re, 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 um, uh, induced uh, by shake-up more or less exponentially declines with increasing uh, 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 energy. So, we, I mean, in the specific systems that we have looked at so far, uh, the dominant population emerges uh, at levels with binding energy of at least 10 EV or more. Above that, the population is just a percent or less of, of the others. Maybe there is other cases where this is not the case, but at least uh, in the systems that we have looked at. Well, this is our probing process, right? Or what, 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 what kind of, I mean, this is what eventually makes the electron tunnel, or? Okay, I'm not so sure. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you, uh, we have to create, we have to create conditions where we do not reach uh, the electrons in the neutral atom. I'm talking to you, but you don't listen to me. Um, so we, we induce, uh, we, 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 we realize experimental conditions where the electric field is not strong enough to reach the electron, uh, even the most loosely bound electron in the neutral atom. It just doesn't do anything. So that means, at least this is what, what I conclude from that, that basically down at that level, the laser doesn't do anything. So now we, 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 we excite the atom, which uh, induces some shake-up, and this is what we probe. So uh, what exactly, I mean, we can be at least sure that below the shake-up levels, uh, the laser doesn't do anything. I agree with you that we have to be very careful uh, about, about the, the population dynamics of shake-up, uh, uh, and, and, and have to check very carefully that we do not uh, uh, populate very high uh, 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 high levels close to the vacuum level because then the, the, the situation gets really messed up. I agree with you. But uh, as, li as long as we can make sure that, that we populate levels with a pretty large binding energy and this seems to happen in most cases, I think we are pretty safe. <laughs>